one point we need to, to articulate here. You sound like you're making your own data models, um, uh, but there are also industry standard data yes. models for networking. A lot of uh, models written in the Yang, in, yes. in, written in Yang by the IETF uh, or by the Open Config Group, et cetera. Could you comment on those? It's a good point. I'm actually in the middle of transitioning. So it, it, even the tools we're using now are ever evolving. So, you know, Ansible at the time is on my older platforms was limited to serial SSH commands, right? It wasn't an API. I was SSHing in and running a bunch of commands serially, which is, I don't want to diminish that capability. But now that I have newer platforms that actually have a REST conf API, uh, you know, the Catalyst 9000 series, for example, mm -hmm. I can easily in a command or two enable the REST conf capability if I have AAA running on the switch, that's it. You can start using Postman against the switch. And it's just incredible because it's restful. And, you know, oh, you like, mentioned another tool, Postman. Another so. tool. I, I, yeah, another tool. But um, it lets you interact with just like, um, like you mentioned, the Yang model. I don't have to invent my own model, right? So yeah. the, the, the advantage of, of REST as, as a framework, it's not a protocol. SOAP is an old protocol. It's P, right? Protocol. REST is just a loose collection of developers doing things their own way, which doesn't really fly in the structured world of routers and switches and I have 48 interfaces and, yeah, right? Yeah. So now we come along with a Yang framework that says, okay, here's a little bit of a loose framework that structures the JSON so it's not the Wild West router by router, iOS by iOS. Um, the nice thing is these models are on GitHub. Like Cisco's opened the door for this open world. It's really remarkable. And I'm saying Cisco because that's the world I live in. But Arista's doing the same thing. Juniper's doing the same thing. They're opening the doors to their APIs. Like these are private giants. That's, that's great intellectual stuff. And they're just giving it away. You just have to start to learn to use the new tools. So when I say Postman, it's new to me as well, relatively speaking. It's like, to me, it reminds me of Netscape Navigator. It's like it has the sidebar and I have to put in, in the old Netscape days, you had to put in the actual HTTP string you wanted um, to get to a web page. And so it's sort of like that, except it's against an API. So I have my switch, I've got 48 interfaces. I can make an HTTP get request against the API and get a restful response of JSON data, so structured data that gives me the status of interface one or the routing table or whatever. You, you just summed up that, that so well what, what restful is all about. People hear that if they haven't never done it before, maybe it seems mysterious, but it just isn't at all. No. It's essentially an HTTP formatted GET request. You say, hey, uh, API listener on the other end, this is the thing I want. Oh, you want this thing? And let's assume you're authorized and authenticated. I'm going to give you back a chunk of data. And that chunk of data is a, a blob of JSON or it's one, one key value pair. More likely, it's a, it's a whole chunk of key value pairs. And now you've got the structured data that's come back to you and you can do something with it. It's incredible. And then I shied away from APIs. Like, I, I, I don't know, I take Cisco uh, Prime infrastructure as just as an example, right? It's, an, it's a, a management tool and it, and it has an API. It's always had an API. I've used it since Cisco Works. So Cisco Works to Cisco Land Management Server to Cisco Prime infrastructure. And I'm just starting to use the API. And I feel like, um, you know, I, I, I feel like I've been doing it a disservice because the information I get through the API is just, it's just incredible. So I can make a, a, a request to tell me, you know, the state of my wireless access points. And I get a nice JSON report back that so, tells me in structured data, the state of my wireless. And to it sounds do like the, we, just, we just tied this back to how these APIs and that structured data we get back help us with uh, the automation of state validation. So what you're saying is, you're just giving this example of uh, talking to these WAPs, right. you're, gonna, you're making an API call uh, you're getting back in from you know, structured data that now you can check programmatically and make sure that the state is what you want. Yes, that's the, you've, you nailed it. So in this example, and again, take an API as an abstraction, whatever is behind the API is behind it. It's a, it's a load balancer. It's a firewall. It's a switch. It's a router. It's a web page, right? Abstract that you can get structured JSON back. And, and the importance of that is 
remember your old show run command or show interface status or show IP interface brief, uh -huh. and you get the what do you call that? That's not structured data that you get back from those no, commands. I mean, it's, right. It's formatted on the screen in columns with a header or whatever. Oh. Right. If you use that in Python and you, you, you suck that chunk of text back in, you need a parser to parse through right. it and make, turn it into something structured because it comes back to you unstructured if you're using like NetMeco. Right. And I'll, I'll, we'll talk about parsing in a second. But the, the, the difference is now I get the structured JSON back. So I can make an API call and it's – so. If you're an Ansible fan or if you're wondering about Ansible, I'm using an, a universal module. So it's a URI module. So if there's, right, with Ansible, I can automate basically anything with an Ansible specific module, iOS underscore config for Cisco or uh, whatever, right? Or this universal URI module if they have a REST, if your service offers a RESTful API and you get JSON structured data back and it's incredible. So I'm getting 3,000 wireless access points. That's my footprint. That's not, I, you know, I don't know if that large or medium, but that's pretty big. There's a lot of wireless access points, a lot of data, uh, right? And I get 76 pieces of information about each access point in structured programmatic data, right? So I do this pass, boom, go get all the data. And then I can look at the key field that says cap WAP status, down, boo. Mm -hmm. Loop over that and tell me how many APs of the 3,000 have the key capwap status dot, you know, or capwap status colon down. Loop now, over them all. What are you using to do that looping iteration? Are you using Python? Are you using uh, no, I'm else? just using uh, Ansible. I'm just okay. using Ansible to do that. Yep. And uh, so, and it's a when. So I do like an Ansible when I don't get a 404. So if the, if the switch is in prime, you get a 200 back on your first get, then pass that switch along and get all of the wireless access points that are connected to it. Uh, this is up on DevNet Exchange and GitHub, by the way, what I'm talking about. I've made this public, feel free to go take it and use it. I, I love it. Um, so then the next step about state, right? So I have captured the state. I can run this every four hours, every eight hours. I know through Git, through my history, through version control, Here's the 10 APs that were down yesterday that are now back up. Or you've lost 100 APs since the last run of this report. Automatically track through Git version. Like, I, I don't have to do anything. So then what's the next step? And, and I haven't done this yet. This is theory and just thinking ahead. I could run a second Ansible step to go over all of those CapWAP down go to the key pair value. So the key is the key and a paired value just to break it down, right? Host name, switch. The key is there is host name and the paired value is switch. switch. So I look upstream to the key pair value for the switch and the connected interface. And I do a shut, no shut on those interfaces. What's the first thing a human would do to fix a, for, fix a down AP? You bounce the port to see if it picks yeah. up power and, and a DHCP and it makes a cap wap. Yep. So now I've just done that. Every four hours, go ahead, scrape my network for down APs, and then bounce the ports if you find them. And then and that's whatever logic you want. Because I have a Jinja template, I could actually, you know, so I bounce the port and it doesn't come back. Okay, shut the port, default the port, apply my templated config to the port, and then bring it back up. Let's see if reconfiguring the interface automatically restores the service. So now we have a self-healing wireless infrastructure. And it's not hard to do. It's through an API call or two and some, you know, if else logic, right? The, the, the caveat being you do need to think through extenuating circumstances and make sure your logic is uh, robust. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. So you don't end up doing something that would, you know, cause an outage because you didn't think of some circumstance or corner case where my, you're, yeah. My first, th the first thing my colleague said was, well, what if Prime loses connection to the WLC, but all of the, APs are still up. Do you really want to bounce all 3,000 interfaces automatically in the middle of the day for no reason? Yeah. And so, no, <laughs> exactly. I don't. No, I don't. What, that's not, to our earliest point, that's not my intent. Right? So this is like <laughs> when, when you hear the horror stories about, you know, AI is going to kill humanity because that's how AI figures out the best way to establish peace on earth is, right? <laughs> if there was no humans, everything would be fine. I don't, you have to be very careful with this stuff. Um, 
because of blast radius, right? The, I love that term, right? So the closer you get to a central controller like the WLC or the core of your network, the larger the blast radius, the bigger the impact on your state can be, right? So <laughs>